Hello again, I'm Ender Lee. In this example, I'll be adding database persistence to the Play Framework web application we've built over the previous three tutorials. I'll start with the completed application from last time, where we added a model class to represent products. In the example, you created a product object and displayed it in the view. This time we'll add eBean, an object relational mapper, which will be used to store and retrieve product data from a database, like this here. An ORM, such as eBean, maps data or entities in our application to database tables. The mapping process examines the object model, that's the classes and the relationships, and generates required tables and relationships in the database to represent that model. An ORM also provides an interface between the objects and the tables, making CRUD, that's create, read, update and delete, functions easier to manage. I'll follow these steps. Firstly, I'll configure the application to use eBean and connect to the database. Then I'll redefine the product class we worked with before as an entity class. Next, I'll generate the database tables from the model, add some sample data, and then read the sample data to display it in the products view. The application must be configured to enable support for the eBean ORM and the database. First, the eBean plugin must be enabled. Next, we'll include the necessary dependencies in the build file, and finally, configure the database connection. Start with the project folder. Inside that, you'll find plugins.spt, and around line five, you'll see a line that's commented, which loads up the SPT eBeam Play, sorry, SPT Play eBeam plugin version 4.06. So uncomment that line. You, if you look at the documentation using the link in the comment above, you'll see more details about that and how it's configured. Save the file, and you can close it then. Next, we'll open up build.spt. This is the build file, which loads the necessary dependencies during compilation. If you open up that, you will see around line seven, lazy val root equals and some other details. At the end, it says enable plugins. Put a comma next to that and then play eBean. Down further, there's a the library dependency plus equals juice. Delete that line. If you uncomment the next line, that loads up juice evolutions and java jdbc which are also required evolutions as part of the ebean rm which allows you to update the database automatically when a change has been made to a class and the java jdbc enables a connection to the database the next line is the h2 database this is the database that's built into the play framework and we'll, that's what we're going to use just for convenience it means you don't have to configure an external server or database this is enabled by uncommenting that line if it isn't already uncommented and then save the file. Finally, we'll configure the database connection. Open up application.conf from the conf folder and locate the DB section on line, it's around about 344, it might be a little bit different. In that section, you'll find the default driver and this will load a driver for the H2 database we configured earlier. Just uncomment that line. Further down, you'll see an option for a URL, default URL for the database. We have the option of creating an in-memory database, which will get created and destroyed as the application starts and stops. But I think it might be better to use a database on file or on the disk. And if you uncomment the line that I've included, that will create a database file called products DB in a folder called data in the directory structure here. Next, we need to enable the username and password. I'm not going to change them. You can change them later on if you want. SA will be the username and blank password. And finally, at the very bottom of the file, the ebean.default. That tells ebean where to look for model classes, where to look for entities that need to be mapped to the database. Models.asterix means that it will search the models package or models folder in the app directory for entity classes to map to the database tables. And that's the full configuration. Save the file before continuing. After making any configuration changes, it's a good idea to start SBT and compile to check for any errors which may have been introduced by your changes. The product class must be modified and marked as an entity so that it can be mapped to a database table and accessed via eBeam. Import the necessary Java classes at the top. These are required for Java persistence, eBeam support and also validation. Then we will mark the class as an entity, an eBean entity, so that it can be mapped as a table in the database. And that's achieved by adding this syntax here, at entity, just above the class definition. The product class itself needs to be modified so that it extends model, giving it access to eBean features. 
The ID property needs to be marked as the primary key so that we can uniquely identify objects. And we're also going to add in some validation so that when a new object is created, we can set certain fields as being required, such as name, category, and description, and set other parameters for stock and price so that they have a minimum value of zero. Finally, add the find method. This is a query helper which will be used to retrieve product objects from the database. It can return all products as well as products by ID and other criteria, similar to an SQL statement. At this point, the application has been configured and the product class has been redefined as an entity class. That should be enough for eBean to create the database and also create a table for the product class. We can test that by running the application. I'm going to type SBT run and then open it up in the web browser. As the application compiles, eBean will notice that there's a new entity class and it will try to create a table for that in the database. If the database doesn't exist, it will be added to the directory structure and you'll find a new folder called data which contains products DB matching the URL that we created in the application.com file. Back in the browser, you will see that the database needs evolution. eBean wants to apply a script to create the table for product. If you look at the script and compare it with the properties in product class, you'll see that they match. You have ID, name, category, description, stock, and price. The types are a little bit different, but that's part of the translation from database and Java. There's also a primary key defined, which we have defined using the annotation, at ID. So apply the script, and that should create the table, goes back to the normal homepage of the site once it's completed. And we can check what the database looks like by opening up the H2 browser. If you press enter or maybe even control D if that doesn't work, if I type in the command H2 hyphen browser, it should open up the web interface for the H2 database. Now the driver is from our application.conf. This is the connection string. If you don't know what it is, you can copy it from here, the default URL. You can just paste it in there. The username and password, again, from the configuration file, I left them as default, so SA and blank. You can test the connection or just connect. And I should see a table product here. If I click on product and run the query, you can see I've got an empty table. I'm going to go back at this stage to the application and enter some sample data to show you what happens. Back in the root of the application, there's a file called sampledata.sql. And there's also under the conf folder, a new evolution and default folder. Default is inside evolutions. Default contains one.sql at the moment, which is the generation script for the product table or any other tables that need to be created in the database by eBeam. We can add an optional 2.sql to the same folder and that will allow us to enter some sample data. I'm going to drag that sample data up into the default folder and rename it as 2.sql. The, the naming scheme is important. The evolution will follow 1.sql then 2.sql. And eBean will monitor this folder for any changes and then it will automatically update the database. So the next time you run the application, it should insert these details. When you look at 2.sql, it's just a series of insert statements. The first two commented lines at the top are important. If you get rid of those, it may not work, or it won't work, I should say. Save that file, and we'll also start run the application again. Remember, we had to stop it to run the H2 browser, so I need to run it again to go back to the web server, localhost 9000. And this time when I refresh, I should see another evolution update. Anytime I make a change to the model class or the, those SQL files, the database will try to evolve or change. So it's now telling me I need to run this script. So it's inserting again. Now we're back to the home page, which indicates that it was successful. I'm going to press enter to shut down the web server and type H2 browser again, and we'll see how the database changed. So connect again. And this time when I click on the product table, go to run, and there's all my sample data. Now that we have a database filled with product objects, it's time to retrieve those products and display them in a web page. We're going to do that in the home controller, just like before where we created the single object and sent it to the view. Now we're going to retrieve the list of objects and send them to the view. Delete the current code in the products method. We don't need that anymore. And at the very top, we're going to need to import some Java classes so that we can work with lists and also with eBeam. And um, we're going to need 
three imports. Let's paste them in there. Make it quick. eBeam, array list, and list. That allows us to work with a list of objects that we're going to retrieve back from the database. Then down in products, we're going to create our array list. So it's going to be a list, a list of type products. Product. So it's a product class. And we're going to create a list of products. So it's going to be called product list. And that is going to be equal to product. This is our, again our model class dot find dot all. I'll explain where we get that in a second. So that's the list, and this is filling the list with by calling product.find.all. If you want to see where that comes from, open up the product entity class. You'll see that we created this find method here, which is calling the super class. The super class, remember, product extends model, which is part of eBeam, and that allows us to carry out functions like that, query the database to retrieve a list of objects. In the background, it converts the table rows into objects and puts them into the list for us. That's what we're doing here. So we have a list of products now. Next step is to send it to the view. Just like we sent the single object, P2 or P before, I'm going to send product list to the view. Save that file so we don't lose anything. And I'm going to open up products.scala.html. Now at present, it's importing or it's matching that parameter so in the controller i'm sending a parameter product list in the view i need to accept the parameter that was sent from the home controller just like before except this time it isn't a single object it's a list of objects now just to make this look a little bit less messy instead of uh, referring to models that product i'm going to import that class just like i did in the in the controller so i can have an at import models that product statement so then I can refer to product instead of models that product. Next, I have to change that parameter so it's product list. And instead of being a single product, it is a list of products. So list and square brackets. That indicates that we're now receiving a parameter which is a list of product. I could have put model dot product in there, but I wanted to show you that you can import as well. So now I have a product list and it is of type product, it contains products. The next thing we need to do is display it in our table. Instead of just displaying one row, I'm gonna display a row for each object. So I'm gonna put a loop around, a for loop around that row, that HTML row. I'm gonna just paste it in for speed, but I'll explain it all now. That's just comments, which will be in the final upload, or the final repository on, on GitHub. The for loop, is going to take each product in the product list. We've retrieved the list that's coming from the top, remember, from the controller. And the for loop is going to iterate through that list. So it's going to start at the very beginning of the list, product list zero, up to whatever the length of it is. And it's going to find objects in that list of type product. So it's going to find, for each product in the list, it's going to create a row to indent it over there and it's going to repeat that over and over again until it's finished the, the row i'm going to put a little comment in there to say end of loop it's a good idea to do that if in case especially when you're working with fairly complex code or, or there's lots of content in the page so that you can see the start and end of of a uh, braces and other elements like that but this will repeat it over and over again until it's finished displaying each of the objects that it's found in this list. It could be one, it could be a hundred. We don't know in advance. It's a, it's a dynamic page. And because of that, you don't know for certain how many it's going to find. I have, uh, I've already, I don't have to change this because I am, I've just modified the for loop so that it's retrieving one product at a time. I'm still calling product.getID, name, category, description, stock, and price. And that should be about it. We can then test the application and see if it works. So I'm going to save that file and run. And once it's ready, I will refresh it in the browser. If there are any errors, they'll show up in the browser. They'll also show down here. In fact, I do have an error. It's telling me that value product list not found. 
So let's see what's happening there. Line 34, um, product list not found. Products list. I've called it product list up here, okay? And products list here. So I just need to change that. Change one of them, it doesn't matter which one. If I change this one actually, product list makes more sense than products list. So I'll save it again. When you see one of these errors, don't be too daunted by it. If you find out, have a look at what the error is. In most cases, they'll be easy enough to follow. Not every time, but most of the time, they'll be easy to follow. Look at the line number and then see if you can spot what's wrong. I'll refresh that now. Okay, cannot find symbol product, another error. Product.find.o. And, oh yeah, another obvious error. So this is in the controller this time, line 34 and home controller. This time it's saying it can't find product. And that's because that should have an uppercase P. So it's the product class that I'm referring to. It's a list of the product class. Save it again. And this time it's loaded up the page. So I'm gonna to go to the products page and I should see my list of products. So it's, in, it's inserted a table element, or a, table, a row element into the table for each item. The styling is coming from Bootstrap. If I view source or inspect element, you can see what each one looks like. Um, you should see a separate, let me do that again. There they are there, so we've got rows for each one. So a separate row for each product that was found. The for loop achieved that by inserting a new row each time. And that's everything finished for now. You can find a completed tutorial at this repository on GitHub.